Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to an analysis invited talk at ICM. Thank you for joining us. My name is Benjamin Sarah from University of North Texas. Uh, it's an honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, Stuart White from University of Oxford. Stuart is speaking on uh, classifying simple amenable C star algebras. Stuart. Thank you very much. Let me first thank the program committee for inviting me to give this talk. I'm, I'm really uh, honored and flattered to be invited. Uh, I'd also like to thank everybody who's uh, worked incredibly hard uh, to put this online ICM together in such uh, short notice and so impressively. Uh, let me also thank my collaborators, mentors, and, and the whole community that have worked on the classification of simple amenable c star algebras. The theorems I'm describing today uh, are the theorems that belong to an entire community of uh, researchers. So I'm not going to uh, attribute them all that carefully. That will be in the uh, uh, written version of the talk. Uh, but the theorems, we, we regard the classification theorem that I'm describing as belonging to many hands, which is the whole team of people whose papers over 30 years have been required. Uh, for the results I'm going to try and describe to you today. So the classifying operator algebras. So um, what are operator algebras? Well, firstly, uh, the canonical example, of course, is the bounded operators on infinite dimensional Hilbert space, uh, B of H. You have to insist on bounded operators because it doesn't come for free if the space is infinite dimensional. And this has both uh, algebraic structure, the structure of a star opera algebra. Multiplication uh, is given by composition of operators. The adjoint is given ample as on the slide. And this also comes with the analytic structure given by the operator norm. And then the cool thing is the sort of the interplay between the analysis and the algebra, which is given by the C star identity, that the norm of T star T is equal to the norm of T squared. And that gives so much rigidity to the class of operator, al operator algebras. So for example, if the space is N, uh, the C to the N, you're working with the operator algebra of the N by N complex matrices, and the star is the conjugate transpose. And then we could define our operator algebras as substructures of these uh, B of H. So there's two different types, C star algebras and von Neumann algebras. Uh, so the C star algebras are the star subalgebras of B of H closed in the operator norm, whereas the von Neumann algebras, these are the star subalgebras of B of H closed under pointwise limits, the topology of strong operator to convergence. Now, if you've not met these before or you haven't seen them for some time, it's like you go down to the playground, there's two young children playing there, they turn out to be siblings and, and you see them and they look very, very similar. But as you get to know these children better, you realise that um, they are, um, you know, they have their own different personalities. Uh, maybe one's a bit better behaved uh, than the other. And the same is true for our uh, operator algebras. They've got the personalities of topology and measure theory respectively. So C star algebras are topological in nature. Every commutative C star algebra is the continuous functions vanishing at infinity on a locally compact space X. Commutative von Neumann algebras are L infinity functions, uh, essentially bounded uh, measurable functions on some measure space. And this nature persists into the non-commutative setting. We'll see things like homotopy, uh, equivalence, uh, dimension theory, uh, invariant from algebraic topology, notably K theory on the C star algebra side, and measure theoretic concepts pervade the theory of von Neumann algebras. Okay, so that's the, the types of objects we're considering. What are we trying to do? We're trying to uh, prove structure and classification theorems for these operator algebras. So classification theorems, large classes of operator algebras determined up to isomorphism, and I would like them to be determined up to isomorphism by invariants that you can compute in natural examples so that you can see, you know, if you're given a concrete construction, you, you have a chance of deciding whether these two operator algebras are isomorphic by calculating uh, the invariants. This should be complemented by abstract structural theorems, which enable you to verify the classifiable hypothesis and also come back from classification uh, to get uh, structural uh, consequences thereof. And the paradigm that we're aiming to follow is the amazing results achieved in the theory of von Neumann algebras, structure and classification results, the very first one from the 1940s, but Kohn's amazing work in the 1970s on amenable von Neumann algebras, which really gives uh, definitive results in this setting. And the Elliott classification program for Cister algebras has been this large scale goal trying to achieve analogous results for Cister algebras. And although I won't be discussing anything to do with the proofs today, it is worth noting that the proofs now start to see the analogy between von Neumann algebras and Cister algebras too, in that very much in the last 10 years, uh, von Neumann algebraic methods have been used uh, in the Elliott classification program to drive these classification results. And as I said, this really is work of many people uh, over many decades. <laughs> 
So let's have some examples to carry through uh, throughout this talk. Of course, I cheated and defined operator algebras by saying they're subalgebras of B of H. So whenever you've got some mathematical object represented on a Hilbert space, you can take the, the operators in the image of the representation and, and form the algebra they generate, and that will give you uh, an operator algebra. Uh, and I want to highlight doing that from group action. So if a group G, for me, typically countable and discrete, is acting on a space X, which is compact Hausdorff if I'm doing c algebras or me a measurable space if I'm doing von Neumann algebras, then I'll get an action on the corresponding function space. I'm going to highlight the C-star settings. So I get an action on the continuous functions uh, on X, uh, given in this way, alpha G of F is F composed of B to G inverse. So for example, imagine the integers acting on the circle by rotation by an irrational multiple theta of two pi. The orbit space is not Hausdorff. It's, it's not an appropriate vehicle to study this action. We can instead try and associate some sort of non-commutative uh, operator algebra, some non-commutative topological space to study this action. And that's going to be built in the spirit of the semi-direct product construction for groups, going to embed C of X inside C of X uh, cross G. So you're going to put this C of X inside some larger algebra to make the action inner. So I want the action alpha now to be spatially implemented by unit trees. So C of X cross G is a non-abelian c algebra generated by a copy of C of X on some uh, Hilbert space and a load of unit trees UG implementing the action in the sense that UG F UG star is alpha G of F. Uh, and then these unit trees provide a representation of G, so UG UH is UGH. For example, the irrational rotation algebra, if you perform this construction, which I haven't provided all the details of, you'll get a C star algebra generated by two unit trees U and V satisfying these uh, commutation identity that uv is e to the two pi i theta vu. And we think of this as a non-commutative torus because, well, commutative torus would be the continuous functions on the torus. That's going to be generated by two unit trees u and v that commute. And now we've got these, uh, this non-commutative torus where you've got a slightly different commutation relation. And this u here is associated to the, the unit tree generating the copy of c of t. And then this v is the unit tree that implements the uh, action alpha one. Uh, of this irrational rotation algebra. So there are some examples to look at. Uh, we could also take a special case where the, the point, the space X is just a single point. So there's no interesting action, but you've still got the group unitary. So you're gonna get operator algebras associated to a unitary representation of G. And actually the nature of the construction is that you get the so-called left regular representation of G. Um, you also get the, uh, so you get these the reduced group t algebra and you get the von Neumann algebra in this way. And these are really canonical examples of uh, operator algebras. This process generalizes the Fourier transform in the setting of locally compact abelian groups. So if G is abelian, the c star algebra associated to G is going to be abelian. So it's a continuous function on something. And the something is the Fourier dual of G. Likewise, the von Neumann algebra of G is the um, essentially bounded measurable functions on G. And so you can see that for the integers and the integer squared, while the Fourier dual is the circle and the torus, the circle and the torus are measurably equivalent. Can't see the difference uh, in measure theory. Uh, so the von Neumann algebras will be isomorphic, whereas the circle and the torus are certainly not homeomorphic as topological spaces. So the group C-star algebras are going to be non-isomorphic. And you see that there's going to be more, if you like, the, the the classification problem for c star algebras is inevitably going to be more complex than the classification problem for von Neumann algebras. Let's have another construction. So uh, here's a construction of uh, some c star algebras as inductive limits. So I'd like to uh, take uh, the scalars, the one by one matrices, which I'm thinking of as a sort of large one by one matrix in this picture and embed it into the two by two matrices by uh, chopping the size of that one by one matrix in half and putting it down the diagonal. So the entry A11 becomes A11, uh, A11 uh, down the diagonal like so. And that's now thought of inside a copy of M2, which had the same total size as the original copy of uh, C. And then I can enlarge my M2 and look at all two by two matrices like so, chop it, consistently in half and embed it into M4, uh, as shown, enlarge to consider all of M4, embed it in M8, and so on and so forth. And in this way, I'm getting an inductive limit of finite dimensional uh, star algebras. 
and all of the connecting maps are star homomorphisms. And moreover, um, because of the nature of the construction, it's all compatible with the normalized trace on those algebras. So for example, if you take um, in the two by two matrices, my normalization condition on the trace is such that A1, I normalize the trace of the identity to be one. And so the trace of this matrix is a half of the two, the sum of the two diagonal entries. And when I include that into the four by four matrices, I get a quarter of the sum of the diagonal entries, but of course each diagonal entry in the previous picture is repeated twice. So these normalized traces agree. So in this way, the inductive limit uh, of all of these algebras has a normalized trace. That will be a star algebra, but it won't be complete. So I should plonk it on a Hilbert space and close it either in the norm topology, and I'll get a C star algebra M to infinity. This is the canonical anti-commutation relation algebra that appears in mathematical physics. Or I could close it in the topology of strong operator convergence and get a von Neumann algebra denoted R. And the trace is extending to a normalized trace on both of these algebras. So although I'm thinking of it as a, a large matrix that I can chop into two to the N by two to the N pieces for any N, I don't think of it like the picture of B of H as being infinite by infinite matrices because the trace on the identity in my algebra M to infinity is one. And if you think of the matrix picture of B of H, the trace of the identity has to be infinity. And these are really quite uh, different. So you'll notice that something suggestive has happened with the notation. The two lives in the notation at the C-star level and it doesn't live in the notation at the von Neumann level. And that's because of this amazing theorem of Murray von Neumann from 1945 that there is a unique hyperfinite um, infinite dimensional simple von Neumann algebra of a trace, so, uh, which is acting on a separable uh, Hilbert space. And that unique object is R. So I grouped those hypotheses uh, into two groups. The group in blue, which I said very quickly, I would like you to think of as just a group of building block hypotheses. So these are uh, hypotheses which will be shortened to being called a 2-1 factor, Simple here means no non-trivial von Neumann algebra ideals. And um, these are like in a precise way, sort of the building blocks of the theory of von Neumann algebras. Whereas the red hypothesis, hyperfiniteness, that's the deep hypothesis in this theorem. Hyperfinite means that you arise as an inductive limit of finite dimensional algebras as in the previous example. So if I'd replaced the two by two matrices and worked with the three by three matrices inside the nine by nine matrices inside the 27 by 27 matrices and so on and so forth, I would also get something that was an inductive limit of finite dimensional algebras. So the resulting von Neumann algebra would be hyperfinite and isomorphic to the construction I got with the uh, two by two matrices. So this is an incredibly uh, deep and important theorem. It's one I really enjoy going through uh, with new PhD students. We we, we tend to study this theorem, and I really enjoy it a lot. But it comes with a drawback. And the drawback is that that hyperfiniteness condition in red is a priori only checkable when it stares you in the face. So, you know, in the previous example, I built the inductive limit of finite dimensional algebras, so it's going to be hyperfinite. But if I go back to the group example, it's not so easy to see when a group von Neumann algebra should be an inductive limit of finite dimensional algebras. Um, maybe if the group is an inductive limit of finite groups, then you'll get hyperfiniteness, and that's really the case. But in general, that's going to be very difficult to establish directly. And this is the breakthrough that Kahn made in the 70s, was to characterize uh, hyperfiniteness purely abstractly. And what he did was to give an operator algebraic version of amenability for groups which is readily verifiable in examples. So he gives this abstract condition, I will call it amenability. Uh, I won't uh, give you the definition. Uh, it has the property that the group von Neumann algebra LG is gonna be uh, amenable if and only if the underlying uh, discountable discrete group G is amenable. And then more generally, you can expect in concrete examples to decide whether your von Neumann algebra is amenable or not, provided you know enough about the the data of your underlying mathematical object that you're building it from. So through Kahn's theorem, you can access Murray and von Neumann's theorem and suddenly the theorem becomes just incredibly more useful. You get this marriage of structure and classification, structure, uh, Kahn, classification, Murray von Neumann, there's a unique, separably acting, amenable C1 factor. And this then, uh, this 
result uh, and the methods behind it are really just uh, so influential in the field. It leads to a, a complete classification outside the trace case. So for traceless hyperfinite factors, the last piece was done by Uwe Holrup. We do completely understand the meanable von Neumann algebras and the impact outside, say, measurable dynamics has also been absolutely immense. It's pretty much impossible, I think, to write a paper on von Neumann algebras without implicitly using Consphere, if you do, even if you don't use it uh, explicitly. So the, the reach of this result uh, is, really, uh, is really major. I want to pick up on just one aspect of the many uh, deep ingredients in the proof, which is uh, a tensorial absorption condition. So I built up R as an inductive limit of copies of the two by two matrices, but I could have viewed it as a representation of the infinite algebraic tensor product of copies of the two by two matrices. And if you take an infinite algebraic tensor product of the same object, you can split your indexing set, in this case, the natural numbers into two uh, sets of equal cardinality, the odd and even uh, natural numbers. And so the infinite tensor product of M2s will be isomorphic to the infinite tensor product of M2 tensor to the infinite tensor product of M2, and it should be no surprise that that extends to the von Neumann uh, tensor product as well. So R is isomorphic to R uh, tensor R. And a key step in Kahn's proof uh, is that he's able to show that an amenable 2-1 factor, the sort of thing he would like to classify M, has that R is acting as a tensor unit. So it's so-called Macduff, which means that M is isomorphic to M tensor R. R acts as a tensor real unit, on the class of algebras that Kahn is intending to classify. And we will see that uh, step again later. Okay, let's have a look at some of the invariants that will be needed in the C-star side, because we sort of know we expect more, a more complicated uh, range of invariant for classifiable C-star algebras. Because for example, um, in that C-star inductive limit, you can see the matrix size. So if I work again with the three to the n by three to the n matrices, what we get is that the inductive limit M2 infinity is not isomorphic to the inductive limit M3 infinity. And the reason is because of the difference between norm approximations and pointwise approximations. If you've got two projections, which are close in norm, then they will have, uh, in the matrix algebra, then they'll have the same trace. Whereas if they're only close in these, um, in the topology of strong convergence when we do this completion, then they'll get, have close traces. And that's the difference. So in particular, if close projections in norm have to have the same trace, you won't be approximating a projection one naught naught naught, which has trace a half, by any projection in a three to the n by three to the n matrix algebra, because there are no projections with trace a half in m three to the n. Um, and a little perturbation argument can then be used to finish the job and show that these algebras are not isomorphic. That's all uh, rather ad hoc, and, and to proceed further, we should you know, develop a theory, and this theory is, is well known, it's the, the theory of K-theory uh, in the setting of operator algebras, so a non-commutative extension of a tier and Hertzberg's K-theory for spaces. So what we're doing, uh, what's going on here is for a unital Cster algebra, the k naught group of A is constructed from equivalence classes of uh, projections in matrices over A, because projections in matrices over C of X are in one-to-one -one correspondence with vector bundles uh, over X. This is why it's a non-commutative extension of the class of the and Hertzberg's K theory for spaces. So I've written down what you get um, when you do this to uh, M N infinity. So the K naught group you get is um, these rationals R over N to the K uh, as shown, which is the difference of the traces of projections in matrices um, over uh, M, N infinity, and it comes with a distinguished element, the class of the unit, that's a special projection, we, we know uh, where that is in our algebra, and that gets mapped to one, and so if you take this uh, set here as a subgroup of R together with one, that's enough to distinguish all of these M, N infinities. So that's one part of the invariant in the classification theorem for C-star algebras. The other thing we need are the traces. So the simplicity condition on these two one factors, so two one factors simple with trace, the simplicity condition actually forces that trace to be unique. And then these M2 infinities uh, also have unique trace because each uh, full matrix algebra has a unique trace. But in general, uh, on a simple C-star algebra, simplicity of a C-star algebra does not force uniqueness of a trace. 
Uh, and so, uh, in fact, any uh, showcase simplex can arise, any metrizable showcase simplex can arise as the collection of traces on a uh, separable C-star algebra. So there could be lots of traces, but somehow in examples, they turn out to be canonical. So uh, when you do this cross product construction and you look at traces on C of X cross G, where G is the group acting on X, the traces are in one-to-one -one correspondence with invariant measures on X. So measures on the X, which are invariant under uh, the group action. So if we go back to our uh, favorite example, the irrational rotation, um, that's got a unique invariant measure. That's why we use an irrational multiple of uh, two pi, namely Haar measure. That's going to give me a unique trace on the cross product. The K theory is computable. Uh, there, are, there are gadgets for doing this. In this case, the pims of Voigt-Gillescu sequence and K naught of uh, the irrational rotation algebra is uh, Z plus Z. There's also a K1 group, which I didn't describe, and that's also uh, Z plus Z. So neither the K theory nor the traces help decide whether these algebras are isomorphic or not. But if you combine both the K theory and the traces, now you do have enough information. So remember this K naught group, that's coming from equivalence classes of projections in your algebra. So you can apply uh, the traces to that, and that's what's happened here. I've applied uh, the trace to K naught to the image, the trace, uh, the unique trace in this irrational rotation algebra to the K naught group, and that will embed this or map this K naught group into R. And where it goes is to the subgroup Z plus theta over two pi Z. And this is a calculation that was, that was done some time ago. And from this calculation, uh, because the position of the unit, which is uh, going to go to the uh, unit in R, because the position of the unit is known, this is enough to decide when these two irrational rotation algebras are isomorphic. And that's going to happen if and only if theta 2 is plus or minus theta 1 modulo uh, 2 pi uh, z. This condition here shows you that if um, the algebras, um, yeah, it, that yeah, this condition here uh, shows you that this is going to be a uh, necessary condition. And then if this uh, theta one is plus or minus theta two, then you can just go back to the construction and check that they are isomorphic. So moral of the story, K theory alone is not always going to be enough. Traces alone, not always enough. K theory plus traces, uh, the sort of things you might need uh, in order to aim for classification result. OK, so what does the Elliott program aim to do. So it aims to classify simple, separable, amenable c star algebras by K theory and traces. Simple and separable, uh, so simple is no closed, no non-trivial closed two-sided ideals. Uh, this is analogous to the separability, the simplicity condition appearing in uh, the work in the von Neumann setting. Separability, uh, countable, uh, dense set. This is always going to be needed for this sort of classification result to run some form of intertwining backward, back and forward argument and construct an isomorphism. So the important word on the slide is the amenability. And this is a C-star algebraic version of Kohn's von Neumann algebraic amenability condition. In fact, you can write down the definitions so that they really do parallel each other. And the only change is in the, in the form of the topology that you use uh, to make the approximations. It satisfies the, the idea that the reduced group C-star algebra should be amenable if and only if the group is amenable. So amenability really is uh, for operator algebras generalizing the concept of amenability for groups. And it's readily testable in examples. So I gave you like one class of uh, construction here for the construction from groups. But typically, if you're building your C-star algebra from concrete mathematical objects, from representations, then you'll be able to decide in terms of data associated to that object, whether or not the c star algebra is amenable. But we can't expect the sort of direct analog of Kohn's theorem to hold where amenability implied hyperfiniteness, because for example, the continuous functions on the interval uh, is gonna be an amenable c star algebra, every commutative c star algebra will be amenable, but the continuous functions on the interval uh, only contain one finite dimensional subalgebra, namely the scalars. So there's certainly not going to be inductive limits of finite dimensional subalgebras. So we can't have the, the direct amenable to inductive limit of finite dimensions. That's uh, not going to be true. So it's, uh, it was an amazingly ambitious program when this was suggested by George in uh, 1994 that this uh, should be possible and, and really uh, very visionary that, um, that to go in this level of generality. 
Okay, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to classify simple sepal amenable sister algebras by K theory and traces. So I put down uh, two sister algebras A and B uh, in the gray bubble of simple sepal amenable sister algebras, and I compute the K theory and traces, which we'll denote as LA and LB. And if they're isomorphic, um, then I would like there to be an isomorphism between A and B. And classifiability for me will lean, mean just a little bit more. It will also mean that the isomorphisms lift. So if I'm given an isomorphism between the Elliott invariants, then there's an isomorphism between the Cister algebras, which does induce the specified isomorphism between the Elliott invariants and in a suitably unique way. So I want to illustrate visually um, sort of what's the sort of scale of work that's happened here. So uh, we started out a long time ago, uh, results actually prior to the one I'm going to draw, but I'm going to highlight uh, George Elliott's result from 1976, which was classification of AF algebras. These are approximately finite dimensional algebras. They're the C star algebra uh, analogs of the hyperfinite algebras, those generated as norm inductive limits of finite dimensional C star algebras. So I'd like you to imagine them as this red bubble in the middle. And what that means is that, that inside the red bubble, we have classifiability. So if A and B are inside the red bubble, their invariants are isomorphic, it follows the algebra is isomorphic. Uh, there were classification results before this uh, due to Glim uh, describing those uh, limits of matrix algebras I described. But this is somehow, I think, really the starting point of this classification program. And then over time, the bubble has expanded. There have been increasingly general inductive limits. So not just of finite dimensional algebras, but of um, matrix algebras over continuous functions over uh, spaces with various restrictions on the spaces. Um, there's been a lot of work in this direction, really very deep uh, and profound results. But you have the same problem as with the very uh, the Murray and von Neumann um, classification results, that if you're going to classify inductive limits, one really needs to know uh, that um, the, um, you know, when your algebra is in the classifiable class. So when is it an inductive limit? So for example, if you take the irrational rotation algebra, really deep results in the 1990s showed that you could write the irrational rotation algebra as an inductive limit uh, of matrix algebras over uh, circles. So that brought it within inside the classifiable class, which meant not only can we use k theory and traces to distinguish between different irrational rotation algebras, we can now use k theory and traces to distinguish uh, the irrational rotation algebras from all the algebras inside the classifiable bubble that they're currently living in. And then the, the bubble gets larger. Um, and this, this isn't a continuous process. Sometimes it takes big leaps. A really famous one is the kirchberg phillips theorems from the 90s, which is really the situation where there are no traces in the final classification theorem that I'm describing. And then it continues to enlarge again. And the question is, how far do we get? Can we expand this bubble all the way out to the class of simple, separable, amenable C star algebras, uh, or do we have to stop somewhere? And if we have to stop, where do we stop? Okay, so um, it turns out that there are counterexamples in the C star setting. We, we can't expect uh, a classification using K theory and traces to get it all the way out to the, um, to the boundary. There is a simple inductive limit of C star algebras of the form matrices over continuous functions on spaces with the property that it's not isomorphic to its tensor product with M2 infinity, but you can't see that with K theory and traces. And nor can you see it by adding countably many homotopy invariant functors into abelian groups. So this is a result uh, really crystallized in this form by Andrew Toms. So the bit in red, you should really read of, okay, I mean, you must be able to see they're not isomorphic somehow, but the way you see they're not isomorphic is, is not going to be through something that you can reasonably add to the invariant and say, this is going to be computable in large number of examples and solve the classification problem. So I think really the spirit of these counterexamples is, is not that one should be trying to add more things to the invariant to to reach a, um, a full classification, but rather that one should be abstractly trying to describe 
the class of things that we can characterize by, classify by K-theory and traces. And so one of the things we learn is, of course, that either A or A tensor M to infinity, at least one of those cannot be in our uh, classifiable class. We're going to have to decide which one we like the most. Do we like A or do we like A tensor M to infinity? Which one of these should be in our classifiable class? So we need to try and find some way of um, finding this uh, dividing line, if you like, between the classifiable C-star algebras and the exotic. And so what I want to do in the uh, last 15 minutes of the talk is, is describe these potential dividing lines and give you the uh, overall classification theorem. So one thing one can do in hindsight to, to identify these dividing lines is, is to look at the constructions of these counterexamples and see, see how they work. And one of the things that you do when you do that is it, it's very important in this construction. I mean, the, the XNs turn out to be uh, products of spheres. And you need uh, to take a, the power of the product, so the, the sphere, to a very large power where the uh, dimension of the, uh, the product of the sphere is much, much larger than the matrix size in order to be able to pull off the, the Euler class obstruction that is used to construct these counterexamples. So somehow it's a higher dimensional topological phenomenon that's appearing in these counterexamples. So it becomes natural to try and, and find some sort of non-commutative dimension theory as a potential dividing line between the classifiable and the exotic. And that, um, can be done using the so-called nuclear dimension, which is a non-commutative covering dimension for C-star algebras. It, it's a non-commutative covering dimension in that it satisfies that the nuclear dimension of C of X is the dimension of X in the sense of LeBay covering dimension for a compact house door space, which of course uh, in the, is going to agree with the dimensions of manifold whenever X uh, is indeed uh, a manifold. Uh, it's defined in the flavor of covering dimension too, so it uses sort of refinements of, uh, of open covers via some, some kind of non-commutative partitions of unity. It satisfies reasonable looking estimates uh, that you might expect a dimension to satisfy for things like direct sums, tensor products, extensions. So it is somehow of the flavor of a dimension theory. And importantly, all of the counter examples, so the, the A's, they have infinite nuclear dimension. And it turns out in hindsight that A tensor M to infinity has finite nuclear dimensions. This one's finite and this one. Uh, the A is infinite. Moreover, of course, you know, the other thing one can try and do is, is if you're going to classify by k theory and traces, you can try and build models of all of these uh, C-star algebras, realizing every possible k theory trace pairing. And this has been done, and they all turn out to have nuclear dimension at most one. And what that means is that, you know, if the class of finite nuclear dimension uh, algebras are classified, you can't extend the bubble past that class because the invariant is exhausted on the finite nuclear dimension C star algebras. So you can't add anything outside because if it was also in the classifiable class, you just check the invariant and then it would be the same as something with finite nuclear dimension. So uh, nuclear dimension is very much a possible dividing line. If we can classify algebras of finite nuclear dimension, it must be uh, the maximal classifiable uh, class using K-theory interest. So that's one possible way we could identify the classifiable C-star algebras. Another way we could do it is through uh, non-commutative tensor units. So if you recall, I highlighted one of the groundbreaking ingredients in Kahn's work was that the hyperfinite 2-1 factor was a tensorial unit for uh, amenable 2-1 factors. Um, and I want to know if there's a C-star analog of this. And if there is, it will certainly mean that we want a C-star algebra D which is at least a tensorial eigenpotent. It has to satisfy D is isomorphic to D tensor D. And um, some of these in the unital setting you can write down. So for example, the complex numbers certainly works. M2 infinity, M3 infinity. These all work for the same reason as before. They're all um, representations of infinite tensor products of the two by two matrices and the three by three matrices respectively. So you can split the grouping of the tensor products and to see that D is isomorphic to D tensor two. But I mean, asking, working with C is obviously not what we want, right? This is, you know, asking for C to be a tensorial unit. This is not a, an interesting condition. All C star algebras are isomorphic to their tensor product with C. Asking for these guys to be tensorial units, that's more interesting 
but it's not going to happen all that often, right? So if you're, you know, if A is isomorphic to A tensor M2 infinity, because we can chop um, the unit in M2 infinity in half, what will happen is that every projection A will be nicely um, divisible in half. And in fact, K naught of A will have to be so-called two divisible. And that won't always be true. So asking for these guys to be tensorial units is, is too strong a condition. And really what we need is a C-star algebra D, which is not the complex numbers, but has the same K-theory as the complex numbers. So I would like it to have the K-theory being integers uh, and zero. So the integers in K naught, zero in K1, together with a unique trace. And then if you assume that a Cunif formula holds for D, it will follow that for any C-star algebra A, the K-theory and traces of A will be the same as the K-theory and traces of A tends to D. So if you find such a D, it will not necessarily act as a tensorial identity on all C-star algebras, but it'll certainly act as a tensorial identity at the level of the invariant we're working with. And again, that will mean that, well, if, if you have something like, like this, if both A and A tensor D are inside some classifiable bubble, then A must be isomorphic to A tensor D. Now, this uh, condition on the K-theory immediately rules out these uh, full matrix algebras or these, these UHF algebras, these inductive limits of full matrix algebras. So we need to look harder for such a D. Uh, and it's no surprise that there is one because why well, I'm giving this slide. And um, the construction is uh, due to Zhang and Su in the late 90s. Uh, it's the Zhang Su algebra denoted Z. And the reason we choose, of course, Z is it's got the K-theory is the integers in in K0. This was found in the late 90s. Um, I thought about describing it to you, but the construction is uh, a little intricate. It's, it's not terribly difficult, but it's a, it is a little intricate. Um, and it involves all sorts of, of parameters. Um, and by now, there's a number of different ways you can do it. You can build up the Jiangsu algebra from groupoids. A number of people have done this. Um, and, and again, you've got lots of choices in how you do it. So you've got all of these sort of slightly not entirely natural looking constructions with lots of choices of parameters, but no matter how you perform those constructions and what parameters you choose, you get the same algebra in the end. The isomorphism class is the same. And so I would sort of argue that, you know, even if you do, if you do a load of things that aren't at first sight appearing terribly natural and you keep doing this and you keep getting the same thing, that actually that thing you get really is natural. And that I view is, is sort of what's going on. Uh, with the Zhang Su algebra. It's sort of a non-commutative version of the complex numbers. So it has the same K theory and traces as the complex numbers. And I think sort of a deep in insight that will have happened around 2000 is that inside the classifiable bubble, you can either have the complex numbers or the Zhang Su algebra. Actually, you should have the Zhang Su algebra, not the complex numbers. Um, and this uh, is, I think, an important uh, observation. So a couple more facts about the Jiangsu algebra. Uh, its nuclear dimension turns out to be exactly one. And then because of this, uh, it does satisfy this Kuhnif formula. So A and A tensor Z will have the same K-theory and traces for all uh, C-star algebras A, which means again that um, the class of algebras, which are Z-stable, for which A is isomorphic to A tensor Z, those are going to be, if they are classifiable, they're going to also be a maximal classifiable class. Because if you've got, you know, if all the algebras A tends to Z are classifiable um, and you've got some other algebra B, which is classifiable, then B and B tends to Z have the same uh, K theory and traces. So B must be isomorphic to B tends to Z. So this is this notion of Z stability in a really precise sense, which I won't give you, it is a non-trivial tensorial absorption hypothesis and it's the minimal such. So it's the minimal hypothesis akin to the theorem that Com proved that we can impose on C-star algebras. And although I can't describe Z to you terribly easily, there are actually quite efficient tools for describing uh, Z stability without mentioning Z at all. And those really in spirit go back to the work of Dusan McDuff when she characterized when it was true that a 2-1 factor tensorially absorbed R. So you've got these two potential boundaries for the classification theorem, finite nuclear dimension and Z stability. And the structure theorem, if you like, 
for uh, these C star algebras is that these two conditions are equivalent. So again, we've got this blue batch of hypotheses, which I invite you to read as simple building blocks in the spirit of the uh, conditions in Conn's theorem, simple, separable, amenable. I don't want to include the matrix algebras. And then the following are equivalent. Finite Newton dim dimension and Z stability. And once you have these, the Newton dimension comes down. So if you tensor an algebra by Z, whatever the Newton dimension was before, A tensor Z has dimension either zero or one. So that's the structure theorem. And this is complemented with the classification theorem that this plus one more condition is exactly what you need, need for classification. So again, the blue hypotheses akin to the, um, those in Conn's theorem, and then Z stable Seaster algebras that are simple, separable, unital, amenable, satisfying this uh, UCT class condition of which I'll say uh, something in just a moment, these are classified by K-theorian traces. And I contend this is the, the C-star analog of the Murray von Neumann Kahn whole group classification for amenable von Neumann factors, and really 25, 30 year uh, work uh, of many researchers, particularly the classification theorem. We, we really do attribute that to many hands, uh, the entire community. So uh, the UCT class, I won't say much about this. It means you satisfy a non-commutative universal coefficient theorem, which computes KK theory in terms of K theory. It is, you know, if you contrast these two deep red hypotheses, the Z stable hypothesis, this can fail. There are simple C star algebras, the, the counterexample algebras are not Z stable. The UCT hypothesis, it's open whether this uh, is automatic for amenable C star algebras. So, do all amenable C star algebras satisfy this universal coefficient theorem? This is an incredibly uh, important and challenging problem, but no counterexample is, is on the table. Any C star algebra we can write down explicitly is going to satisfy the UCT. Um, I can think of one or two that that's not actually known, but it, it will be known uh, in the not too distant future. There's no candidate counterexamples. So if you want to use the classification theorem, you'll have to find out why your C star algebra satisfies the UCT, but trust me, it, it will if you, if you wrote it down explicitly. And it's the Z stability thing that, that you'll have to check. Uh, and to get it inside the classifiable class. Um, the range of the invariant is understood. We know what all of the K-theory trace pairings of these C-star algebras are. So this enables us to get structural consequences from classification. So instead of, as used to be the case, having to carefully show that some C-star algebra coming from groups or dynamics was an inductive limit of, of a particular type in order to get it classifiable, now we can say, okay, it satisfies the conditions of the classification theorem and everything in the classification theorem has an inductive limit structure. So we get the inductive limit structure from classification rather than needing to get it to access classification. Another really nice result, uh, not mine again, is that all classification, uh, all classifiable c algebras have models as twisted group point algebras. This is a result of Shinley. Um, I want to end then final slide on the uh, examples that I've been talking about all the way through. So how testable is the hypotheses for these C of X cross G's? Well, the blue conditions are easily described. So if G is acting on X, it'll be unital um, because I'm assuming X is compact. I'll get separability from my assumptions on G and X. Amenability of the cross product will follow from amenability of G or more generally when the action is amenable. And um, simplicity can be described very nicely. I think when the action is free, uh, then minimality is what you need for simplicity. And that means that all orbits are dense. So this is something you can check concretely in your uh, classifiable, in the algebra you wish to classify. So you have to address the UCT and Z stability. But in this case, a very deep result of Jean-Louis II building on work of Hicks and Kasparov, when G or the action is amenable, uh, the UCT will be automatic. So actually, all that remains is Z stability or finite nuclear dimension. So wh which one should you go for? Should you go for Z stability or should you go for finite nuclear dimension? And the answer is it depends. If the C-star algebras you're building are built from uh, objects of uniformly bounded uh, topological dimension, then um, you should go for finite nuclear dimension. So for example, it's much easier to prove Z has got nuclear dimension one than it is to prove that Z is isomorphic to Z tend to Z. It doesn't help you with a the structure theorem to use that because you need that Z is isomorphic to Z tend to Z to use the structure theorem. So in our cross products, 
when are we working with things that are morally finite dimensional? Or when, that's when the group is polynomial growth, so virtually nilpotent by Gromov's theorem, and the space is finite dimensional. In that case, you can calculate the nuclear dimension, but that's the largest class where you can calculate it directly. So if you want to go past that, you really need to use uh, Z-stability. And here are two really uh, great results that do so. Again, not mine. So C of X cross G is Z-stable now. Whenever G is uh, of elementary amenable group, so much, much larger than the class of virtually nilpotent groups acting freely and minimally uh, on some space X of finite covering dimension. You get the Z-stability uh, through the, these deep results. And only after the facts can you get uh, finite nuclear dimension and one could also get actions of uh, certain actions of, on infinite dimensional spaces provided the action somehow has some kind of finite dimensionality and much much more is expected here so we'll be able to to increase the class of algebras covered by the classification theorem uh, over coming years so that's all i have time for so thank you very much uh, for your attention thank you so much Robert, for a beautiful talk um I don't see any questions, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, bye for now.